economics expands because the opportunities expands, profits expands, wealth expands, and so forth. So there's plenty of dislocation, but in aggregate, are there more people employed or fewer? The answer is more people with higher paying jobs. So that's Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google. And while a lot of people are worried about the coming mass AI job loss, Schmid says we're looking at it the wrong way. He's not denying job loss, in fact, far from it. But in his view, the real danger isn't mass unemployment. It's not adapting fast enough. So let's break down what he actually said and what it really means for us. Let's get into it. All right, so first of all, shout out to the Moonshots with Peter Diamandis podcast. This has quickly become one of my favorite podcasts. The guests are always interesting and the conversations are always extremely insightful. So definitely make sure to check them out. In this week's episode, they had on, of course, Eric Schmid, but also Dave Blunden, a venture capitalist and founder of DataSage. One of the first things they talked about was programming, specifically the future of programming. And while it's now widely accepted that programmers are pretty much cooked, I don't think people really understand what that means. Because it's not just that programmers won't have jobs. It's that everyone will now be a programmer. Check this out. Now, programmers don't go away at the moment. It's pretty clear that junior programmers go away. Mm. The sort of journeymen, if you will, of, of the stereotype. Because these systems aren't good enough yet to automatically write all the code. They need very senior computer scientists, computer engineers who are watching it that will eventually go away. Yeah. One of the things to say about productivity, and I call this the San Francisco consensus because it's, it's largely the view of people who operate in San Francisco, mm -hmm. goes something like this. Uh, we're just about to the point where we can do two things that are shocking. The first is we can replace most programming tasks by computers, and we can replace both most math mathematical tasks by computers. Now you sit there and you go, why? Well, if you think about programming and math, they have limited language sets compared close, to human sets, language. Yeah. So close, they're, they're simpler computationally and they're scale free. You can just do it and do it and do it with more electricity. Mm -hmm. You don't need data. You don't need real world input. You don't need telemetry. You don't need sensors. Yeah. So it's likely, in my opinion, that you're gonna see world-class mathematicians emerge in the next one year that are AI based mm -hmm. and world-class programmers that are gonna appear within the next one or two years. When those things are deployed at scale, remember math and programming are the basis of kind of everything, everything yes. yep. right? Yep. It's an accelerate, uh, accelerant for physics, chemistry, biology, material science. So going back to things like climate change, can you imagine if we, and this goes back to your original argument, Peter, imagine if we can accelerate the discoveries of the new materials that allow us to deal with a carbonized world. It's, right. it's very exciting. So I think the point he's trying to make here is that the idea of programming being automated shouldn't necessarily be looked at as a bad thing because it will actually be a tremendously good thing for everyone. I mean, just imagine what you can get done if you had your own personal software engineer that never sleeps, never complains, and that can turn your rough ideas into working code at a moment's notice. This would literally feel like a superpower you can create entire apps for whatever you want, automate any remotely repetitive computer task, create entire games, literally anything you can think of. And so if everyone is now a programmer, yes, programming might no longer be a job title, but the programmers of today will be the architects of tomorrow, the ones guiding, auditing, and pushing these systems even further. Meanwhile, everyone else gets a massive upgrade because when coding becomes as easy as typing a sentence, we unlock new capabilities for everyone. And that's exactly why Schmid says this isn't some doomsday scenario. It's actually the start of a productivity boom where wages go up and people do more valuable work, not less. Take a look. How do you think about the job market over the next five years? Um, let's pause it that in 30 or 40 years, there'll be a very different employment, robotic, human interaction. Or the definition of, of, do we need to work at all? The definition of work, the definition of identity. Let's just posit that. Uh, and let's also posit that it will take 20 or 30 years 
for those things to work through the economy of our world. Um, now in California and other cities in America, you can get on a Waymo taxi. Um, Waymo, it's 2025. The original work was done in the late 90s. Yes. The original challenge at Stanford was done, I believe, in 2004. The Dopper Grand Challenge. It was 2004. Right. 2004. When Sebastian threw in That's right. one. Yeah. So, so more than 20 years from a visible demonstration to our ability to use it in daily life. Why? It's hard, it's deep tech, it's regulated and all of that. And I think that's gonna be true, especially in robots that are interacting with humans. They're gonna get regulated. You're not gonna be wandering around and the robot's gonna to decide to slap you. It just doesn't, you know, society's not gonna allow that sort of thing. To. It's just not, it's not gonna, it's, it, it's not gonna allow it. Yeah. So in the shorter term, five or 10 years, I'm gonna argue that this is positive for jobs in the following way. Okay. Um, if you look at the history of automation and economic growth, automation starts with the lowest status and most dangerous jobs, and then works up the chain. So if you think about assembly lines in cars and you know furnaces and all these sort of very, very dangerous jobs that our fore, forefathers <clears> did, they don't do them anymore. They're done by robotic solutions of one another, and typically not a human or a robot, but an arm. So the, so the world dominated by arms that are intelligent and so forth will automate those functions. What happens to the people? Well, it turns out that the person who was working with the, the welder, who's now operating the arm, has a higher wage. And the company has higher profits because it's producing more widgets. Mm -hmm. So the company makes more money and the person makes more money, right, in that sense. Now, you sit there and say, well, that's not true because humans don't want to be retrained. Ah, but in the vision that we're talking about, every single person will have a human, a, a computer assistant that's very intelligent that helps them perform. Mm -hmm. And you take a person of normal intelligence or knowledge and you add a you know, sort of accelerant, they can get a higher paying job. So you sit there and you go, well, why are there more jobs? There should be less jobs. That's not how economics works. Mm -hmm. Economics expands because the opportunities expands, profits expands, wealth expands, and so forth. So there's plenty of dislocation, but in aggregate, are there more people employed or fewer? The answer is more people with higher paying jobs. So the basic premise of his argument is that yes, AI is coming for our jobs, but it's also going to literally give us superpowers. And with those superpowers, we'll be able to reskill extremely fast and take on more complex, creative, or abstract roles. Jobs that AI either can't do yet, or maybe never will. And that will also be much higher paying. Now, personally, I'm not totally sold on that. Yes, historically, automation has created more and better jobs in the long run. But AI is just different. It's moving exponentially faster than anything we've seen before. And I honestly believe it could outperform humans in every meaningful way. Sure, the tools will improve. And yes, they'll help us adapt for a while. But eventually, we're either going to have to merge with AI or get left behind, straight up. And that's exactly what they dive into in this next clip. The idea that the companies and people who don't move fast enough won't survive. Take a look. And I've been trying to tell them exactly what you just articulated, where... A lot of these people have been in the company for 10, 15 years. They're incredibly capable and loyal, but they've learned a specific white collar skill. They worked really hard to learn the skill and the AI is coming within no, no more than three years and maybe two years. And the, the opportunity to retrain and have continuity is right now. Mm -hmm. But if they delay, which everyone seems to be just, let's wait and see. And what I'm trying to tell them is if you wait and see, you're you're really screwing over that employee. So it, so we are in wild agreement that this is going to happen, and the winners we are the ones who act now. What's interesting is when you look at innovation history, the biggest companies who you would think of are the slowest because they have economic resources that the little companies typically don't. They tend to eventually get there, right? So watch what the big companies do. Mm -hmm. Are there CFOs and the people who measure things carefully, who are very, very intelligent, they say, I'm done with that thousand engineering team that doesn't do very much. I want 
50 people working in this other way, and we'll do something else with the other people. And when you say big companies, we're thinking Google, Meta. We're not thinking, I'm you thinking, know, big bank hasn't no, done I'm anything. I'm thinking about big banks. Um, when, when I talk to CEOs, and I know a lot of them in traditional industries, what I counsel them is you already have people in the company who know what to do. You just don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. So call a review of the best ideas to apply AI in our business. And ine inevitably, the first ones are boring. Improve customer service, improve call centers, and so forth. But then somebody says, you know, we could increase revenue if we built this product. I'll give you another example. There's this whole industry of people who work on regulated user interfaces or one or another. I think user interfaces are largely going to go away mm -hmm. because if you think about it, the agents speak English typically yep. Yep. or other languages. You can talk to them. You can say what you want. The UI can be generated. So I can say, generate me a, a set of buttons that allows me to solve this problem. And it's generated for you. Why do I have to be stuck in what is called the WIMP interface, Windows icons, menus, and pull down that was invented in Xerox Park, <laughs> right? 50 years ago. Why am I still stuck in that paradigm? I just want it to work. So yeah, that's the brutal reality here. The companies and workers who wait around to quote, see what happens, are setting themselves up to lose. And it's not just about coding or UI design or call centers or whatever. This shift is going to touch every industry, which brings up the bigger question. If the world is moving this fast, what should young people, students, teenagers be doing? Schmid actually has a surprisingly hopeful answer to that. Here's what he said. Kids in high school and college now, any different recommendations for where they go? When you spend any time in a high school, or I was at a conference yesterday where we had a drone challenge, mm -hmm. and you watch the 15-year-olds, they're going to be fine. They're just going to be fine. It all makes sense to them, and we're in their way. Um, if they're I digital were digital natives, they're, they're, but they're more than digital natives. They get it. They understand the speed. It's natural to them. They're also, frankly, faster and smarter than we are. Mm -hmm. Right? That's just how life works. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> so we have wisdom. They have intelligence. They win. Right? So in their case, th I used to think the right answer was to go into biology. I now actually think going into the application of intelligence to whatever you're interested in is the best thing you can do as a young person. Purpose-driven. Yeah. Any form of solution that you find interesting. Most, uh, most kids get into it for gaming reasons or something, and they learn how to program very young. So they're quite familiar with this. Um, I work uh, at a particular university with undergraduates, and they're already doing different, different algorithms for reinforcement learning as sophomores. This shows you how fast this is happening at their level. Mm -hmm. They're going to be just fine. They're responding to the economic signals, but they're also responding to their purpose, right? So an example would be you care about climate, which I certainly do. If you're a young person, why don't you figure out a way to simplify the climate science to use simple foundation models to answer these core questions? Yeah. Why don't you figure out a way to use these powerful models to come up with new materials, right, that allow us, again, to address the carbon challenge. And why don't you work on energy systems to have better and more efficient energy sources that are not that less carbon? You see my point. So if you're young right now, Schmidt's message is don't panic. You'll soon have tools at your fingertips that no generation before you has ever had. And you'll have the opportunity to do things you probably can't even imagine right now. But even with all that potential, there's still a deeper issue. Because what happens when everything can be automated? I mean, why pursue anything if an AI can do it faster, better, and with a lot less effort? This is exactly what Peter Diamandis asks Schmid only a few minutes later in the podcast. And his response might surprise you. Take a look. I'm more worried about the case that if you want to do something, it's just so much easier to ask your robot or your AI to do it for you. The the human spirit that wants to overcome a challenge. I mean, the unchallenged life is so good, so critical. But, but th there will be always new challenges. Uh, when I was a boy, uh, one of the things that I did is I would repair my father's car. Mm -hmm. right? I don't do that anymore. When I was a boy, I used to mow the lawn. Mm -hmm. I don't do that anymore. Sure. Right. So th there are plenty of examples of things that we used to do that we don't need to do anymore. But there'll be plenty of things. Just remember the complexity of the world that I'm describing 
is not a simple world. Mm -hmm. Just managing the world around you is going to be a full-time and purposeful job, partly because there will be so many people fighting for misinformation and for your attention, and, and there's obviously lots of competition and so forth. There's lots of things to worry about. Plus, you have all of the people at, at, you know, trying to get your trying to get your, your money, create opportunities, deceive you, what have you. So I think human purpose will remain because it, it, humans need purpose. Yeah, now, that's now it's, the, that's and, the point. And you know, there's lots of li literature that the people who have what we would consider to be low-paying, worthless jobs enjoy going to work. So the challenge is not to get rid of their job, it's to make their job more productive using AI tools. They're still going to go to work. And I, to be very clear, this notion that we're all going to be sitting around doing poetry is not happening, mm -hmm. right? In the future, there'll be lawyers. They'll use tools to have even more complex lawsuits against each other, right? There will be evil people who will use these tools to create even more evil problems. There will be good people who will be trying to deter the evil people. The tools change, but the structure of humanity, the way we work together is not going to change. So what do you guys think about this? Are we entering a golden age of possibility or just speeding toward mass existential confusion? Because yeah, we might all get AI superpowers, but without meaning, without purpose, what's the point? So let me know in the comments. Are you feeling hopeful, worried, inspired, lost, maybe a bit of everything? If so, you're definitely not alone. I tried to read every single comment, and this is one of those conversations I truly believe more people need to be having. So if you found this video helpful, a like and sub really goes a long way. Anyways, thanks for watching until the end, and as always, I'll be catching you guys in the next one.